Great. Hello, everyone. I heard I was out of the room when Michelle introduced me earlier. I'm Don Uramori, the Associate Director of the Environmental Dispute Resolution Program. And I just want to note that it's always so fascinating to me when we do these report outs, how many different ideas come out in different groups. And even just the whole arc of the conversation can be quite different in groups with some sticking right to the questions, some going off in totally new territory. And so I just appreciate the conversations that were had and the fact that I always learn so much. And I hope that folks learned a lot in their groups and from this discussion. Um, I'm very pleased today to welcome a colleague and a friend, Sarah Hinners, who is the acting director of the Ecological Planning Center, as well as a research assistant professor in the Department of City and Metropolitan Planning here at the University of Utah. Sarah is somewhat unique in that she's trained as a scientist and actually has her PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology, and yet is based in a planning department, City and Metropolitan Planning. And one thing I love about working with Sarah is that she brings her training as a scientist to bear on urban and environmental planning issues. I do a lot of interdisciplinary work myself, and I think that brings a really unique and important perspective. Sarah particularly focuses on urban ecology and green infrastructure and is currently doing a variety of work related to water systems. So I think it's particularly well equipped to be talking today when we're looking at things through the lens of water. Um, as part of her work, Sarah has for, been for a while working with scenario planning as well as sort of participatory modeling and different modeling approaches that engage stakeholders. And so today we'll really be talking about those approaches and how they can be used as a tool to support and sort of facilitate collaboration. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Sarah Henners. Okay, so first thing is, is IT guy. <laughs> I did it though, I pressed the right button. <laughs> yep. I guess. Alright. Uh, I test. Can anyone read that font? <laughs> Sorry, bad choice. Um, Alright. And can everybody hear me? If I go over here, can everybody still hear me? Okay, good. Because I'm not good at standing still. There's a roving mic if you want to use it. But then I might, I feel like I need to, to sing or something if I'm, <laughs> and we don't want to go there. Um, okay, so um, one always hopes when invited to give some remarks to be able to recycle material from previous events when one gets to give remarks. And I never manage to do that. Uh, there's a little bit, there's a, just a little bit in here um, from, from previous occasions, but this was, um, this was an occasion for me to really think through uh, something that I might be able to talk about um, that might be a little bit unique to the conversation, might build on the conversation. Um, and so uh, I, I thought about models, and I think a lot about models um, over the last few years. And so I decided to focus um, not quite as much on scenario planning itself, which I will get to a little further in the presentation, but I, I do want to talk um, very broadly about models. Um, and so here's my outline of what I want to cover. Um, first, I want to talk a little bit about decision making and um, what kind of decisions get made and sort of a brief critique of decisions. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about mental models and um, how we, by recognizing mental models, um, we can move towards collaborative models or shared models. Um, and then once we've built some models, I will get to scenario planning and some examples of how all of these things come together. Um, so, some barriers to good decision making. I thought it's good to set up some, some challenges so that we can knock them down as I, as I proceed. So a huge barrier in the modern world is that issues are complex, right? There's almost nothing that's simple, and there's very little to which you just say, oh, there's an obvious answer to this that we can all agree on, so let's do this. So when things become complex, you risk inaction. You're just like, it's too big, we can't do anything, and you just, you're, you end up sort of paralyzed. Um, something that has come up a lot in the conversations today 
is that the way we address these complex issues tend to be through oppositional processes, where everybody has a position. And I thought that um, particularly Bob Fotheringham framed this beautifully. He couldn't have he couldn't have led to where I wanted to go today any better by saying how everybody has this very different, not just perception, but a different set of interests um, that just end up being in competition with one another. Um, often decision making uh, is set up to take place at a scale or a level that is mismatched with the issue or the problem. So that even if you come to a decision, uh, it may not actually have much power to address the, the larger problem. Um, not data-driven, which is not necessarily, I don't want to say that decisions are not data-driven, but often they don't seem to be as data-driven as we think they should be, or we feel like some data is being ignored in favor of other data. So how do we get the right data connected to the right decisions? Um, a lot of decisions that happen uh, aren't set up to be dynamic. So they're sort of addressing one thing at one time, and they have trouble dealing with situations of rapid change, which is sort of the state of the world in the 21st century. And then related to that, there's this issue of an attempt to find a single solution, that there's one optimal, perfect solution out there that we need to find, and if we don't find it, then, you know, we fail. So uh, I, I want to, these are the specific barriers that I want to try to get at maybe um, trying to address some of them. So you guys uh, are all familiar with the concept of the blind men and the elephant, right? Where each of these blind men um, is, is in contact with a different part of the elephant, and therefore they have a very different sense of what an elephant is. Again, this is what Bob was talking about earlier. Um, we all have um, these very different percep perceptions and perspectives um, that all come back to these three of the barriers that I talked about. <coughs> one, that the issue is complex, and no one of us can grasp the entire thing. Two, it becomes oppositional because clearly the guy, this guy down here, is like, well, obviously, this is what it is. And this guy says, well, obviously, this is what it is. And there's no, there's no way for them to come together, right? Um, and there's a scale mismatch, right? They are all gaining their information at a scale that is inappropriate to understanding the elephant. So this brings us to mental models. So we all have our own mental model, um, which is the blind man and the elephant. It's based on our own history, our experiences, our education, our personality traits, you know, what we tend to perceive or be interested in, and the set of values that we hold. So every single one of us in the world, here in this room, um, perceives the world and understands the world and interprets the world in our own unique way. Um, and I often wish that I could, you know, spend an hour a day, I don't know, inside someone else's head so I could just get to see what the world looks like through that different lens just for once because I know it's all different from the way I see the world. So we've got all these blind men. We've got this great big elephant. We've all got different mental models. Um, and... Again, what Bob was saying this morning, this understanding of water, for example, let's see if that's my next slide. No. Okay. That's my next, this is the one I was thinking of. Um, I had actually, he, he was talking about all those different ways that people think about just about water, right? So are you thinking about water supply? Are you concerned about water quality? Are you concerned about fish habitat? Are you concerned about climate change? Everybody has their own number one gateway into the world of water, right? Are you concerned about flooding? Um, so there are all of these different perspectives um, that contribute to our mental model about a particular topic. 
So then, not only that, do you, not only do you have that, but then what if the system that you're trying to understand is in a state of change? So what if your elephant is actually becoming a rhino? Right? But all of these guys are latched on to their understanding of the part of the elephant, right? And it's in a state of change. Whoa. How do you deal with this? Um, does this feel familiar, right? Does anybody feel like, yeah, I'm kind of, you know, in touch with this kind of dilemma? All right, so um, what I want to talk about today is the value of having a model um, of building a shared model of that elephant so that we can all um, use our mental model but move beyond our mental model into something that is shared and commonly understood so we can move forward. So again, this is these perspectives in water management. Everybody has their own key, key view of the world of water. Um, and in the modern world of water issues, all of these people need to be working together. They need to have a shared model. So, um, it's always fun when you can uh, find um, that somebody has already figured out this thing that you've had this strong intuitive sense for for a long time. One of the great things about meeting Danya um, is that I, I don't even remember what we were talking about, but I was talking about something and where I was talking about this sort of shared, shared um, model or something that that brings a group together. And Donnie said, oh yeah, you're talking about a boundary object. And I was like, yes, that is what I was talking about. Um, so it has a name. Um, in fact, seeing Gabrielle right here, I was thinking at the, what I was talking about um, at the time that I discovered about boundary objects was that I was involved, and Gabrielle was, in um, a faculty interdisciplinary learning group last year. Um, where we came from all of these different departments. I was in planning, there was biology, there was a neuroscientist, there was a traffic engineer, there was an economist, and we all came together to explore a single concept. Our boundary object was actually a metaphor, which sounds hopelessly academic and abstract, but it was actually um, very creative and interesting for all of us to take this metaphor and say, oh yeah, that translates into exactly this kind of thing that I think about in my field, but in your field, it's there too. It's just referring to something else. Um, so anyway, a boundary object is something that is external to everyone else's mental model. It's external to everyone else, um, but, we can, but everyone involved in this process can touch it, can tap into it, can help to shape it. So it's taking the mental models and combining them in some collaborative way to create a shared understanding. And the boundary object can be any number of objects. It can actually be a physical object. So I hang out um, in the vicinity of a lot of architects and they build physical models of the buildings that they're designing, right? So that is, those are boundary objects because that is how they're translating you know, what is in their group's heads into a physical object. It can be a verbal statement. So creating as a group a mission statement or a statement of values can function as a boundary object. Um, a lot of collaborative processes use a map as a boundary object. We can all find ourselves on a map, right? We can all relate to our familiar landscape, or most of us can, on a map. Um, my first degree was in geography, so everything in my head is in a map. I just translate it to map automatically. Um, and very often it is a computer model where you are building something um, or you, you build something together uh, that reflects everyone's different perspectives. Um, and what's nice about um, the boundary object is that it gives you something to focus on besides the individual participants' perspectives and views and positions and interests, right? So it takes you out of your positional 
mode and puts the focus on what is this system that we're all talking about? And once the focus is on the system, a lot of that oppositional oppositionality um, is lessened. It sort of fades. Um, so here is just a few pictures of maps, using maps as a boundary object. So as a discussion starter. Um, so here, here is this place that we're going to talk about. What are the features of the place that are important? And I just did a Google image search and came up with these three. There's one from Colorado that looks like um, probably a watershed process. There's one from Bolivia. And what I love about this one here from Nepal is that they don't have a map to start with. So they're drawing their own map, which is great because they're sort of skipping the boundary object and going straight to a consensus model because they're drawing the map right there as a group out of their own heads. So the boundary object sort of serves as the seed for building a consensus model that reflects everybody's different shared mental models of understanding the system. So once you have this shared model, there's a lot that you can do moving forward with it, but it's got to reflect all of these different perspectives and understandings. So, um, again, I think about landscapes and water a lot. So a watershed model, to me, is a great example of, um, of building a consensus model because all of the different perspectives on water, anything and everything you do related to water fits into a watershed model somehow. And I see Carl is here, and we were in a meeting a couple of weeks ago about a watershed model that we are going to be building on a new EPA grant. Um, and so we were over at the Division of Water Quality to talk about, um, to talk about uh, making a model that works for a lot of different people. Um, so the watershed, so building something like a watershed model together collaboratively, again, forces the, say, the water treatment manager to think beyond water treatment in their own facility, right, and to consider other aspects. It takes um, the, the irrigation farmer out of their own particular piece of the system um, into this larger model that includes everybody. Um, and this and the quote was one that I uh, underlined in the book that I was reading on vacation. Um, it creates a shared understanding of reality that can be a basis for action. So once you've got this shared understanding, then you can start to come back to the issue and move forward. Um, so coming back to these barriers and issues that I talked about at the beginning, a consensus model um, helps solve some of those initial problems. One, um, it reduces that, I invented, I think I invented the word oppositionalism. It seems really <laughs> long to be a word and I bet that there's a better one, but that was the one that came out of me at that moment. Um, you can tell I've been in academia too long. <laughs> Uh, anyway, it reduces that, that oppositionalism that can be present in processes that have a very diverse group of stakeholders with different positions. Because the, cons the consensus, the focus is now on this model, um, not so much on everybody's individual set of interests. Um, complexity. So by thinking about this model, this system, from all of these different perspectives, in order to create a consensus model, you end up sort of working through um, a set of a whole universe of possible key components and processes of the model and starting to really pick out which are the really important ones. Which are the ones that are actually moving things around in this system? So it allows you, with, again, from all of these different perspectives, to work your way through a complex issue to create a model that actually seems to reflect the world as everybody sees it. So 
Um, it's not necessarily the final solution to complexity, but it's a good way to take a first stab at the complexity. Um, your scale, uh, by building a, a consensus model, you will probably have identified the appropriate scale for tackling the issue. And by doing that, you may have then identified an, an, an additional set of stakeholders to, that need to be involved. Right? If the issue is larger than your particular scale is capable of tackling, then you're going to need to uh, incorporate um, some different players, potentially. Um, and also, once you have this model, you have a better sense of what you don't know. So you can go out and actually ask some questions, find some experts, collect some data, so that the data that is being brought into your process is inquiry driven. And everybody involved is much more likely to pay attention to the data if they have asked the question, rather than an outside expert coming in and saying, here's what we know, but the data isn't necessarily um, tailored to this particular situation. Um, and it hasn't been asked for, right? It hasn't been, um, it hasn't been generated as a process of this collaborative process. Okay, so coming to the last two issues, which is rapid change and this sense of there being a single solution to the problem, um, here we finally get to scenario planning, which was what I was initially supposed to talk about. Um, this is an awful diagram. Again, I got this off the web, and I tried to look for a prettier version of it, but this is really, um, there's nothing else that was quite as good as this one. So um, this is to bring in the concept of adaptiveness. So again, there's a system that is changing. Um, how does our response and management and, and policy direction respond to the changing system? Um, and so this is a diagram that shows uh, watershed adaptive management. Um, it's, it's an entire process. But what I liked about this is that it has this conceptual model, right? So they have a model as part of the watershed adaptive management process. Um, and it's basically this, you know, plan, come up with some decisions, see what happens, and then uh, collect some data. What you learn from what happens goes back and feeds back into the model. So this model itself actually changes in response to what is observed in, in the real system. So the model itself is adaptive. It's not a static model. And there has to be a process in place for this shared consensus, conceptual model, to adapt and change as new knowledge is brought in. Um, so it has to be responsive to new data. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was the possibility of multiple solutions to an issue. And how do you, um, I, I think in most complex situations, one recognizes that there are multiple different directions that the system could take. Um, but it's, again, because of complexity, it's really difficult to be able to weigh those options against one another. And what having a shared model can do is it allows you to um, try out these different possible directions um, and just sort of see how your model behaves. And you don't have to do this with elaborative computer programming. You know, you can, uh, but um, I can imagine much less quantitative models that still allow you to explore a bunch of different scenarios. So the value of scenario planning, um, this is where I borrowed from previous presentations. <laughs> um, it allows you to weigh the choices that you make now against the potential consequences. 
So it allows you to play out, okay, if we institute this policy now, what happens in 20 years? Um, so you can test that policy option. You can say, oh, wow, I really didn't realize that if we um, put that highway through there, um, that would actually result in, you know, the loss of, you know, 2,000 acres of wetland or something. Um, all the other, one of the huge values of scenario planning is to allow you to prepare for uncertainty. So you can take current conditions and sort of run them forward and imagine what it might be, but there are all sorts of things that we can't anticipate, right? And scenario planning does not allow you to predict the future, but it allows you to imagine a range of different futures, right? And to prepare for a bunch of different eventualities. And having this model that reflects so many different perspectives and, and sets of knowledge um, allows for a much richer um, set of scenarios that could be imagined. Um, it allows you through this process to develop some strategies that might optimize um, between different outcomes and again to collaboratively generate novel approaches that you might not have thought of um, had you just been working with your own individual mental model. Um, so here's an example. Um, I think Alan left. Okay. Uh, oh, well, you know. <laughs> uh, so, so I said, I don't want to talk about scenario planning when Alan Matheson's there because I, you know, I can't possibly know more than he does about scenario planning. But um, I worked a couple of years ago on a, on a large collaborative prog project um, working with Envision Utah and Wasatch Front Regional Council and Salt Lake, Salt Lake County, um, at looking at particularly what I was working on was developing um, a software product called Envision Tomorrow Plus that is a urban development scenario planning tool. And I do not wish to promote this. That's not the purpose of this, but just to use it as an, to illustrate um, this example of a tool that allows you to really envision quite, quite quantitatively a bunch of different um, urban development scenarios. And then I probably won't get to this, um, but uh, I'm embarking on this collaborative model uh, modeling project looking at water quantity and quality in the Jordan River. So the Envision Tomorrow Plus process um, was a close partnership between a private consulting company called Freganitsi Associates, um, the Metropolitan Research Center in my department, which I worked for at the time um, in Envision Utah, and what we were trying to do here was paint the future um, by building uh, a, a, locally, a locally accurate uh, model of a city. So it's like painting the future in that literally you're taking these individual pigments, if you were a painter, I'm not, but I imagine this is what painters do. You take pigments, you mix them to create colors, you choose the palette of colors that you're going to use, and you create a picture. And then you do it again, and you have a different picture. So ET Plus um, allows you to do a very similar thing. And you start with buildings as your pigments. So you actually model a whole suite of different possible buildings that might make up a city, and each of these buildings has parameters um, that makes sense locally, so you interview local builders, and so they have um, building costs and land costs and size and the amount of landscaping and what kind of landscaping and the parking associated with it, all built into each of these individual building models. So they're sort of the basic building blocks. Um, and then a city, of and... So this is just, to make your eyes glaze over, a snapshot of the spreadsheet associated with each of these buildings, which is actually a return on investment model. So it is the same thing a developer would use to decide whether or not to build a building. Um, 
So there's an example again. So then you take a mixture of buildings and you create your paint color, you create development types. So you might take a set of, a homogeneous set of single family houses and you would say, here is a single family residential land use and that is one paint color. You can create mixed use transit oriented development and you can create urban core. So you can take all these buildings you mix them by percentages, and you create this, um, this uh, development type um, that you then uh, include also, you parameterize all of the streets, the open spaces, the public spaces, um, those are all mixed in as you're mixing your paint. Um, and a whole bunch of calculations are carried through this whole process. This is not, it's not pretty, but it's great that we have computers that can keep track of all these numbers for it, for us. Um, and so here, each development type, each plant, each paint color has a bunch of different um, numeric indicators associated with it that you can calculate. Um, and then you load your paints onto your palette. So this is a, an interface with GIS and you paint your development types on a landscape, which gives you an aerial multiplier, and then it spits out a whole bunch of indicators at the other end of what are the implications of this scenario that you just painted on this landscape. And it includes population and jobs and the square footage of the buildings you built and the impervious surface and et cetera, et cetera. So the point of that simply being um, that there's this model that allows these sort of, it has boundary objects, right? It has boundary objects. There's that, um, the initial uh, model where you're building buildings is something that people who build buildings can interact with and say, yeah, this makes sense or it doesn't. Um, and you have an output at the end where uh, people generally, uh, decision makers, for example, might want to look at this cost versus revenue comparison, and you have this map where any, basically anyone can come in and envision, you know, imagine a scenario of development in a particular place. So I'm running out of time, so I won't give any more examples of models, um, but these are sort of my takeaways for models in collaborative processes. One, models can take any number of different forms. They don't have to be elaborate computer models. Um, they have the value of taking individual mental models outside of the individual to create this shared understanding. Um, they can be the basis of inquiry-driven data collection. So you go find out what you as a group need to know. It can be used to test the assumptions that each of us bring as part of our mental models. Um, it can form the basis of scenario planning, and it can help shift the potentially contentious conversation away from the issue to the broader system and what makes the most sense in that system. So now I will stop talking and answer questions for two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. I talk about Sarah. Great. Yes, let's talk with Sarah. That would be better. Any questions? Yes. Um, I'm curious when you put your model together, did you do that collaboratively or was that something that you sort of already knew the parameters and then engaged collaboratively? Um, so the particular process with ET Plus was, uh, was a collaborative process. So um, the, the actual scenario planning uh, process was carried out by Envision Utah. And so they convened people. And they actually did it old school with paper maps. And, then, and they had people sticking you know, the pa colored paper. And, and then they had to translate all of that back into the digital form. So... Ideally, it would be nice to 
have the computer active and you could do it live. And people have done that, but we didn't in this process. Is that available at ETQ on Envision in Utah? Is it on your site? Or do you have yes, but the, uh, yes, there's a link to it. Um, you would, the latest version of ET Plus um, is actually at envisiontomorrow.com org. I never know what comes after the dot. Search for Envision Tomorrow. Yes, and, and I should have put that on there. Um, it, I should tell you that this, that if you're thinking about using ET Plus, we should have a conversation. Because it, <laughs> uh, getting set up to use it is sort of a big undertaking. It's got a, a, a learning curve. I mean, it's just Excel and GIS, but getting the data into a place where you can use it is, let's talk. But there is also, um, the other tools that we developed as part of that project are at wasatchchoice2040.org, which is a subpage on Envision Utah's website. Right, so. <laughs> we can share, we can share. Right here. Okay.